What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash and today is October 13th of 2021. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video, I wanna dive into Bitcoin's revisit back to the trillion dollar valuation mark and dive into why I not only believe there's much more upside to come, potentially rising up to a 3.5 to $4 trillion market cap, but also dive into some data science models that we have yet to really explore here on the channel that could start to give us a gauge of when the market is really overheated. I think everyone's always concerned when we revisit the previous all-time highs throughout a bull market, whether or not it's time to sell, if the market's getting too greedy. Well, there is some indexes we can utilize in order to gauge this. So let's go ahead and dive straight into the conversation, guys. So on a macro level, first off, we just gotta take a step back. Let's just go ahead and take a deep breath and realize we are back to a trillion dollar market cap for Bitcoin. This is huge, guys. I mean, I remember back on the channel uh, when we were chatting about Bitcoin, you know, around two or $3,000 per coin back in 2017. And now we're back up to nearly $55,000 in price. This is just absolutely incredible. And it showcases here that again, we've still got tons of markets to scale in this case to grow compared to other markets. So when I propose this idea, and I'll go ahead and be very upfront with you guys, I'm not gonna say here, I'll give the, the number at the end of the video. No, I'm gonna be very upfront with you guys. I think we're gonna be seeing anywhere from around a 3.5 trillion to $4 trillion market cap for Bitcoin towards the end of the cycle especially if we go into the expanding cycles, in this case, into late 2022, where we're gonna see that Bitcoin top, right? That's at least just our theory, right? We're keeping things as conservative as possible in our time frame estimates, but our prize estimates, I think are very reasonable. And I wanna spend some time to talk about that today because I understand very clearly, I understand wholeheartedly, guys, when we take a look here at Bitcoin's price, its market cap, and we see that it's revisiting back to those highs we had in May, everyone always has the idea in this case that, oh, Bitcoin must be overextended, right? It's gotta crash sometime soon because it's going towards its all-time highs. But in reality, that's actually a really bullish thing for Bitcoin, especially as we're going through a bull market. If you take a look at the logarithmic chart, right, we can see, for example, every time you're revisiting to the previous all-time highs after a correction, right, that's where you start to set in higher price levels. You revisit it to the new higher level, right? You set a new high here, revisit that high, and then you start to climb even faster and faster and faster. The momentum builds and builds and builds. Unless you have, in this case, a major sell-off and start setting significantly lower highs, like we did over here, or over here, in the last, uh, the first uh, bear market, the real significant one back here in 2014, or over here in 2018, right? That's when there's a cause for concern. But we're setting in these higher lows, as we can see here, as we dive into the shorter term time frame. We're setting in these higher lows, these higher highs, and we're pressing back up towards those previous all-time highs at 65K, we're really not far away. This is not bear market price action, to be completely candid with you guys. There's not much room for opinions here. It's just not historically matching towards any bear markets we've seen, which usually show very similar consistencies. Now to mention as well, the optimism is present in the market. But the question we have to ask ourselves here is how significant that optimism is. And what I mean by that is, are we at a stage of euphoria where we should actually be concerned and wanna be taking profit? That's at least what some people feel sometimes after we get these nice rallies up from $29,000, $30,000 all the way up to 55 k in just a matter of a couple of months. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at a really interesting data science model. And it's one that you guys can freely access at lookintobitcoin.com. We love them. It's a great data science platform, a lot of great free resources. And there's a really interesting data science model that although we may have talked about it a long time ago, it's one that we don't revisit very often, but it's one that I actually, I really like. Uh, we just haven't gotten around to chatting about it on the channel. And it's relative unrealized profit and loss, right? So I wanna go ahead and talk about the first uh, key components that we need to understand before we dive into this data science model, right? So just on a surface level here, if you really just didn't wanna even have to think about it, this, um, this basically red line here is a percentage in this case, the, the metric, basically this entire data science model is built to project or build out. And there's categories in this case. So when you get above 75%, you're in the euphoric stages. If you're anywhere between 50 to 75%, you're in the greedy stages in this case. The market's getting a bit frothy, but it's not at the peak euphoria or telltale signs of a market top, right? 
there's optimism and denial, which is like hope and fear here. They're neutral stages where they could be um, a positive early stage of the cycle or a negative late stage of the cycle. And then you have the opposite of euphoria, which is capitulation. So when we go below, in this case, to being negative um, on the percentage metric, then we start to see capitulation. That's the best time to add in when people are really just fudding, they're selling all their positions, even though it's like the worst possible time to do it. Okay, so what does this data science model actually mean and why does it hold some decent degree of credence? Well, we can just see here looking at the red line, not only is it consistent to some degree, but in order to understand what this model is, we need to understand what it's made up of. It's made up of two major metrics in this case, market capitalization, so that is when, for example, you're on coin market cap, you can see the fully diluted value of Bitcoin or the actual circulating market cap, depending on the 8.8 .8 million Bitcoin currently in circulation. Right? So we've got about a trillion dollar market cap here for Bitcoin. Right? So it's taking this metric and it's subtracting it by realized cap. Now, for those who don't know, realized cap is a measurement of when Bitcoins were last moved taking all of the last moves of each Bitcoin and taking the price of those Bitcoin at that time and into an aggregate, almost kind of moving average in a sense. It's like nice smooth value over time that generally increases during bull markets in this case as people start to move it and sell it for other assets, take profits, you name it. That's what realized cap is. It's when you take the entire measurement of all Bitcoin in circulation, the unspent transaction outputs, or every time you send Bitcoin, you know, you're having a UTXO in this case, you're spending your Bitcoin, you're exhausting it in this case and send it to another address. Taking all of those transactions and um, multiplying it, or not per se multiply it, but taking the actual price that they were realized at and adding all those values together. So what we get here, <clears throat> excuse me, what we get here is a really interesting metric where we can take market cap, subtracting the realized cap, and that gives us the unrealized profit or loss when we divide by market cap, right? gives us a nice percentage here, a relative unrealized profit or loss, right? If we were to not divide it by market cap, it would just give us the unrealized profit in this case. How much dollar value <clears throat> in market cap have people not actually materialized or sold? But we want to divide it by market cap here because it gives us this nice red percentage here to compare it to history. The you know unrealized profit or loss in this case is going to get larger and larger both ways as markets get bigger, right? Those major capitulative periods in this case, or the euphoric periods are gonna be making all time high. So it's not as relevant in this case. We wanna look at it at a percentage basis. When do people start taking their chips off the table? When does smart money start to exit from the market and settle in those, you know, those existing tops and cycles? Well, we can see in the data science model that there's actually some really nice consistencies here, right? So for example, we can see here that in practically all capitulation periods of the market, well, let's take a step back before we talk about the euphoric tops, we can see here that not only does price go into this green band here, sometimes uh, much more exasperated, but it's gotten more uh, calmer and uh, usually around the like 30 something percent range here on the lows. So it's negative 33%. This means that overall, there's an unrealized loss of nearly 33 or 35%, usually during the peak of capitulation, the best time to buy into the market. And then what we see here, is a rebound towards optimism, right? A slight, very short-term rebound optimism. This time we had an overextended one. And again, as we've talked about on the channel before, we were way ahead of schedule when we rallied from 3K back here in December 2018, all the way up to 14K uh, just a couple months later, really like six months later in June, right? So again, we, we've had these exacerbated rallies and sell-offs, just like how we really, back here in 2013, or sorry, 2012, and I'll come back to this in a minute, um, even though we had a dip back here, just like we did here in March of 2020, we did not see that last time. We saw much more kind of neutral, continued press, you know, the higher lows here, consistent resistance range, and then a breakout into the higher bands of optimism, right? Now, the reason why I wanted to point out the similarities here is that we've seen a lot of similarities in this cycle to the 2012-2013 cycle, going from the capitulation range, coming all the way up here towards 2013 and into 2014, right? We're seeing a lot of striking similarities, not just in price action, but in the data science models, because we had a much more euphoric charge here, and we really shouldn't have come up this high so early on in the cycle, right? It's just not consistent with, per se, the 2016-2017 cycle. It's much more in line with the 2012-2014 cycle. 
So anyways, let's just go ahead and take a look at face value here, right? We can see here that there are a lot, uh, there are very few period of times, even though there's this, uh, most of it spends time within the greed, optimism, hope, fear, capitulation bands, euphoria very rarely sees any type of revisit to this range, right? We saw it back here during the cycle peak in December 2013. We saw it back here in the mid-cycle peak in April 2013. We saw it over here in May and June of 2011. We also saw it here in December 20, 2017. I might have already mentioned that, but we also as well almost visited it, almost visited it, similar like we did back here and also back here in 2013 during our mid-cycle rally and correction, right? We cooled down afterwards, came back down here into the optimism band. Pretty typical during a bull market to have these pullbacks. And we saw that back here in 2013 as well. Very similar range, the lower band of optimism. Now we've set in two solidified lows here and are starting to charter back higher. But the really interesting thing to take into mind is that even though we're back up very close to those previous all-time highs, just about $10,000 away, we're only at 52% when it comes to the relative unrealized profit and loss versus 75% back here when prices were actually at the same range. In fact, they were lower than where they are right now. Now, how can that be? How can it be in this case that we actually have the data science model reading a lower percentage of unrealized profit, a relative unrealized profit and loss, right? In this case, it's unrealized profit because we're on the upper band here. We're not in a negative percentage. How can it be in this case that prices are actually higher, but there's a, a, a shorter degree of unrealized profits? Well, it's because in this case of the unspent transaction outputs changing over time, that realized profit metric changing, as well as the dynamic of market cap, right? That makes up this data science model. So we can actually find it, that Bitcoin's price is higher than where it was before. Just like for example, you know, the unrealized profit uh, here was about the same Right, the upper 70% range when Bitcoin's price was a little under 1,200, and it was the same, um, you know, in this case, relative unrealized profit here when Bitcoin's price was nearly practically 10, uh, 20x higher, right, than before, and it went around 15, 20x, right. So again, the point I want to make here is that we can see this come back up to this range yet again, and it'll give Bitcoin that room to appreciate. Um, again, depending on how people realize profits and how market cap increases, to where a very, very reasonable estimation would be that Bitcoin could go to $3 trillion, $4 trillion in the cycle, or reach up towards our price target that we've talked about of $150,000, uh, you know, $100,000, $150,000, It's a very spread band, but I think the biggest determiner in this case is how fast the cycle is going. If it's going a lot quicker, in this case, the price level is going to be a little bit lower. Right? We're not going to have that steady level, higher levels of support, higher, uh, higher highs in this case to test, and more time to build up that range of higher price action if we do it too quick. So I'd rather like to see the expanding cycles in this case, right? going into November of 2022, where we see a peak in Bitcoin's price, hopefully near 200K. I think that's very reasonable. It's very reasonable. If we had altcoins owning about you know, anywhere from that time period of setting in those highs around 60, 80% market dominance, you're talking roughly around a $10 trillion valuation, generally speaking, right, in crypto markets. And that's very, very fair to see something like that. And then when gold markets are 13 trillion and there's consistent outflows out of the market when it comes to gold funds, whereas Bitcoin funds are getting massive inflows. It's the asset class of this century, guys. It's a major, major opportunity. And what's so great is that we have these data science models to work with in order to understand where we are within the given cycle and to see that what any potential euphoria we might have in the market, historically speaking, we can see very clearly. If we can't already feel it, we can see that we are nowhere near where we were back at the start of this year in the sense of the euphoria back in the spring. And along with that as well, we're nowhere near the highs of what we saw in 2017 in the sense of the euphoria and unrealized profit. Right? So again, when we get up to these higher bands, this means that there's a lot of chips that could be taken off the table, a lot of profit that's waiting to be realized in this case. And we're gonna be the ones realizing that profit later on in the cycle, folks. We're gonna be using our data science models, we're gonna keep diligent, we're not gonna get caught up in the noise, and we're gonna focus on when it's the opportune time to start taking our chips off the table, realizing profits, and waiting for another discount in crypto markets so we can accumulate more, all right? That's the goal, right? Anyways, guys. 
That's it for today's video. If you guys like this one, please consider dropping a like. If you want to see more data science models like this or you really like when I dive into these different types of market metrics and kind of avoid the headlines, let me know. If you guys want me to also cover some of the news as well, I want to hear your guys' feedback down below. And if you like this kind of stuff, you can always check out the Dash Report. It's a great way to support the channel. It's a newsletter that I write. I cover all four major markets, crypto, equities, commodities, and Forex, and give a really big macro picture to how things are going. So if you guys want to support the channel, that's the way you can do it. The link down below in the description. But until the next video, everyone, thank you all so much for letting me ramble today and joining me in this ramble session. And I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.